Yeah, I think I'm on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Bennett, the Research Manager at the Royal Armies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth talk in the Winter Lecture Series. The Royal Armies is the UK's national collection of arms and armour, with our roots in the medieval stockpile of weaponry uh, deposited at the Tower of London. By the 1500s, aristocrats and diplomats were being shown around the site to impress them with the power of the monarch. By the Victorian period, we had acquired a ticket office, refreshments, uh, and, a gift of, and a guidebook. Sorry, and we now operate from three sites across the UK with a remit to promote the public's enjoyment and understanding of arms and armour. Today's lectures are part of a series exploring topics related to arms and armour across the centuries. If you'd like to find out more about future events, if you'd like to get closer to the collection through our online catalogue, or if you want to keep tabs on our site's reopening, as we hope they will do, please go to our website royalarmies.org. Now, as always, there'll be a question and answer session after the talk. If you're watching on YouTube, please type your question in the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're watching via Zoom, you'll find a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can type questions. As always, while we can't guarantee to get through them all, we'll cover as many as we can. With the necessary preparation out of the way, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Keith Dowen. Keith joined us in 2014 as Assistant Curator of Armour from the Wallace Collection. His main interest lies in the wars of the, 70, uh, the early 17th century, and you can read some of his blogs on the armour of this period on our website. He's also been integral to our exhibition on the field of cloth of gold, and you may have heard him speak at our online conference commemorating the event last year. Today, however, he's here to speak to us about something more medieval. Without any further ado then, Keith Dowen. Uh, possibly because the, the host muted Keith, you might need to unmute him. I'm not sure if uh, it'll let you unmute yourself automatically. I'm, I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, I can hear you, Keith. Yeah. There you go, camera, perfect. Right. <laughs> the slides, slides showing, okay. Great. Okay, well, thanks very much, Mark. Um, so this project on the two shields from Szczecin uh, was the result of a research trip that I undertook with my colleague, Dr. Lech Marek, a few years ago. Um, when we visited the town, uh, we were able to see the shields in the local museum uh, and catalog them. And the result of that uh, research was actually published in 2019 in Arms and Armour, which is the journal of the uh, Royal Armouries. And that can be accessed on the Taylor and Francis website if you'd like to find out more. So the Polish town of Szczecin is probably unknown to a lot of people. Um, it lies on the river Odra, not far from the German border. And indeed, its German name is Szczecin, which some of you might be more familiar with. Uh, we know that in the 12th century, Szczecin had become one of the most important urban centres in Western Pomerania. However, our knowledge of the town's early development is actually largely dependent on archaeology, as there are very few written sources. We know, though, that um, by the end of the 12th century, the nucleus of the urban centre was encircled by defensive ramparts, which you can see on the uh, drawing on the left, on the right of the screen. Sorry, Keith, just to put back in, you might have to reshare your screen because it's not up at the minute. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Thank you. 
there we go. Right, so sorry about that. So yes, um, by the end of the 12th century, the nucleus of the urban center uh, was encircled by defensive ramparts, which you can see on the drawing outlined in blue. And it was in one of these log chambers that formed the inner construction of the rampart that in the year 2000, archeologists discovered the remains of the remarkable painted shield. Now, fortunately, dendrochronology was able to establish that the logs of the chamber dated from between 1170 and 1197. So we have a nice um, date range for the deposition of the shield. Now, the most likely explanation for the presence of the shield in the construction fill is that for some reason, for, a re for whatever reason, it was considered unusable, possibly because it was already broken, as you see um, in the images there. Now, in addition to the painted shield, a second kite shield was also found. Um, this one was found in the courtyard of the early medieval stronghold and can also be dated to the late 12th century on the basis of ceramic finds. Uh, the image on the right of the screen there, I should uh, point out that only two boards of the shield were recovered. So you've got both the obverse and the reverse showing there. Now, finds of wooden shields outside of Scandinavia, where burial practices, um, weapon deposits and environmental conditions have preserved many examples, are much less common and therefore and are therefore invaluable. Now, what's particularly interesting about these, the deposition of these shields is that it occurred during a period of Danish attacks on the town. Now, with Poland, uh, sorry, that part of Western Pomerania and also Denmark competing uh, for um, territory and naval access during the period, uh, there were a number of armed conflicts. And the first attack took place in 1173. Now, although the inhabitants of Szczecin were able to successfully fight off the incursion, the lack of provisions ultimately forced them to submit to the Danish crown. However, the new relationship was far from easy and following further violent encounters, Duke Boguslav of Pomerania was forced to pay tribute to Canute VI of Denmark. Now, following Boguslav's death in 1187, um, Szczecin decided to place itself under the rule of Mieszko III of Greater Poland. Now, naturally, this provoked Canute into attacking the town, and he actually burnt it two years later. So given the um, dates of the shield based on dendrochronology and also the ceramic finds, it's likely that um, they, the shields are linked to these events. So although we can't be certain whether they were carried by the native Pomeranians or attacking Danes, we can hypothesize that they were actually used in that conflict. But before we look into the shields in more detail, it's worth examining our knowledge on kite shields generally. So prior to the discovery of the shields at Szczecin, our knowledge of the appearance of kite shields was based exclusively on pictorial sources. Uh, no other examples are known to survive. But as uh, Lech and I have discovered going through many uh, archaeological stores, you never know what's out there. And it's just possible that uh, well, the part of an unidentified kite shield is lurking somewhere. So the Pitt Rivers Museum possesses a kite shield. And um, a few years ago, I was actually consulted on it. Um, and I determined that it was most likely of late 19th century or early 20th century date based on its construction and the overall appearance. Now, further work done by um, the Pitt Rivers Museum actually was actually able to tie this shield in with some documentary resources in the museum, which does indeed suggest this is 19th or 20th century and um, not an original medieval kite shield. Uh, another kite shield, uh, which you can see on the left, appeared in Switzerland in 2014. However, uh, looking at it carefully, the nature of the shield's construction and the printed or stencil design actually point to a 19th or 20th century date. On the right, you see the shield belonging to Arnold von Brienz, which is uh, held in Switzerland. And until more detailed analysis done fairly recently, it used to be thought that the shield was actually a, um, an early medieval kite shield, which had been cut down and reused at a later date. 
However, some subsequent uh, examination by Helmut Nickel and others proved that this was not the case. And actually the shield had always been in this form. So what about the origin of the kite shield? Well, there's quite a lot of debate about this. Uh, it's a fascinating subject. Um, of course, many people associate them with the Normans uh, due almost exclusively to their depiction on the Bayer tapestry. However, whilst the Normans certainly used them, their origins can actually be traced back to the Byzantine and is Islamic worlds. And in fact, uh, there is good evidence to suggest that the kite shield was one of the royal emblems of the Fatimid dynasty from at least the 10th century. On the screen, you can see the shield reliefs from the Fatimid gate in Cairo. Uh, it used to be thought uh, that these represented uh, captured shields from the Crusaders, but actually more detailed work um, take, undertaken about 10 years ago, I think, actually established that they are part of the royal insignia of uh, the ruling Fatimid dynasty. Kite shields soon spread westwards and by the early 11th century, they appear in Spanish artwork, um, in Spanish artwork and other artwork um, of the period. Now, quite how this mechanism of um, the use of kite shield in Western Europe made it over from Eastern Europe, Again, it's still, sub, it's still uh, subject to debate and there's no uh, tight chronology, unfortunately. But their appearance may have been due to returning Europeans who had served in the Byzantine army. And of course, um, the Norman conquest in Sicily beginning in 1061 and the First Crusade beginning in 1096 may have accelerated their spread in the West. Now we know that some kite tunes were flat or flattish as indicated by their use as improvised table, as improvised tables shown on the Bay of Tapestry. But of course we know that curved shields were also widespread and in fact curved shields might have predominated. Um, some were curved to such a degree that they were almost half cylinders as you can see on the enamel plaque of Geoffrey of Anjou at Le Mans Cathedral uh, shown on the right of the slide. Uh, I should emphasize though that there is absolutely no evidence that the shields from Szczecin were curved, despite um, some uh, claims to the contrary. Uh, if indeed, if they had been curved, then we would expect that the weight of the soil above them would have caused them to deform as with the Roman shields from Europe, rather than flatten perfectly. It is, of course, possible, though, that there was a very slight curve or medial ridge as seen on these shields from Gniezno. But again, there's no surviving evidence of this on the remains. The unusual feature of both shields from Szczecin is that they differ from the standard type in having an angled rather than a rounded top. Now, although this um, type never seems to have been as common as those with the rounded uh, top, examples are present in Byzantine art, Spanish manuscripts and elsewhere. And probably the most remarkable depiction can be found on a deer antler chessman, which was recently excavated in Wrocław and baiting, based on the um, its style of the, of the arms and armor, it's been dated to the 12th or 13th centuries. So moving on to the construction of the shields themselves. The painted shield is made of seven planks simply laid side by side. There are no connecting dowels or tongue and groove joints. The shield measures 85, 86 centimeters at its widest point with the individual planks measuring six to 17 centimeters wide with a thickness of 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 centimeters. Now, although this is larger than most Anglo-Saxon Anglo shields, for example, uh, the 32 shields recovered from the 9th century Gokstad ship uh, have a diameter of 94 centimeters. In order to establish uh, the wood used to make the shield, samples were taken from different areas. Now, although one would expect that the shield boards, the shield itself would be homogenous, there are examples of shields having been made from more than one type of wood, possibly due to later repair, repairs and replacements. And that's something that we wanted to try and confirm in the investigation. 
However, it was discovered um, due to my, uh, thanks to microscopic analysis that the entire shield was actually made of older. Based on the analysis of hundreds of Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian shields, many of which of course are very fragmentary, we know that the woods used included older, ash, beech, birch, lime or linden, and probably quite a few people will be uh, familiar with uh, Scandinavian references to linden shields, maple, poplar, willow, pine, and surprisingly even oak. Uh, but generally older willow and poplar were the most fa favored woods as they're both lightweight and resistant to mechanical stress. Uh, there are eight holes in the painted shield for the attachment of arm straps, of which remarkably uh, the left one actually survives. Now, despite again some claims to the contrary, the position of the second arm strap is about 35 centimeters um, apart from the original. So that's the average length of a man's forearm and hand. It has been suggested that um, if the shield was curved, then the arm straps would be closer together and more comfortable to use. However, when we were examining the shield, we still found that the arm straps spaced um, 35 centimeters apart uh, are still perfectly functional. It should be stressed though, that the exact positioning of the second strap and other straps, including the guige, uh, is purely conjectural. So as I mentioned earlier, only two planks survive of the unpainted shield. However, it can be estimated that the entire shield was probably constructed of no more than five planks in total. And the thickness of the planks ranged from 0.75 to 0.9 centimeters. The line of the shield's rim also suggests it had a triangular apex. Uh, and it was also discovered during scientific analysis that like the painted shield, this one was already also made of older. Now there's been quite a lot of discussion in the literature um, regarding the thickness of the shield boards from Szczecin. Uh, now due to being relatively thin compared to what one might expect a uh, shield to be, it had been suggested that the painted shield was ceremonial rather than battlefield use. However, if we can compare the thickness of the shield boards um, with those from um, Scandinavia and England, we can see that those from Szczecin fall within the normal range. The thickness of the boards, of course, depended on local manufacture and the choice of material. So being denser and heavier, oak shield boards were thinner than those made from poplar or willow. Achieving the correct balance between weight and resistance was therefore key. So what about the assembly of the shield boards? Well, the most common technique was to arrange the boards vertically in a single layer to form a board before being glued to edge to edge. And this can be found on shields throughout the Iron Age, for example. Some Roman shields though, such as the one from Carmel Harit and that from Dura Europus were constructed from laminated boards. However, following the Roman period, this technique appears to have fallen out of use until the 10th century when some shields again begin to be constructed using the laminated or plywood technique. Um, some people might be familiar with the Anglo-Saxon shield from Peter's finger. Originally, it was thought that it was made of laminated um, construction, but actually subsequent analysis has established that wasn't the case and it was made out of a single layer of boards um, joined edge to edge. Now, one such um, shield with a laminated construction comes from the so-called library site at Trondheim, which dates to about 1050 to 1100. Uh, this shield is formed of two layers of wooden planks, and you can see the layers separated on the right, set at right angles to each other and covered with a layer of leather. However, plank construction continued to dominate. Now it's likely that the boards of both Szczecin shields were held together using an organic glue such as casein, which is made from milk protein. Um, it's fairly easy to make it, um, all you, if anyone's interested, all you need to do really is pour vinegar into milk, you skim off um, the casein which floats to the top, and if you have calcium oxide lying around, you mix it with that, and you actually get 
quite a strong glue um, that is also water resistant. And during the Middle Ages, casein glue was recommended in the construction of shields. Now, some shields also incorporated beveled edges to increase the surface area for bonding, but uh, there is no evidence of this on our on the shields from Chechen. The shields, though, do exhibit a beveled outer edge, probably for the addition of a rim. Now, these shield rims can either be made of metal or leather and were designed to provide additional structural rigidity. Copper alloy appears to have been the most favoured material in Anglo-Saxon England, whereas those on the shields from Illerup were of iron. Probably the most famous uh, shield of the period with its rim is that from Mound 1 at Sutton Hoo. Uh, the rim was made of U-sectioned gilt bronze and it was attached to the shield by a number of gilt bronze clips. However, it seems that leather rims increased in popularity between the 6th and 11th century. And we think that uh, the Szczecin shields did in fact have leather rims. Now, shields were usually covered, including on the back, meaning that the wood was sandwiched between two layers of hide rather than the wood being left bare. Um, of course, due to um, environmental conditions, these coverings very rarely survive. According to Theophilus Presbyter in his 12th century uh, work on diverse arts, um, he recommended that ass, ox or horse rawhide was the best material, although linen could be used if these materials were not available. So the purpose of the covering, uh, sorry, when the covering was applied, it was usually applied wet. And as it dried, it pulled the boards together and that was to uh, add structural stability, particularly, and which was particularly important um, in combat when the shields became damaged. And in fact, um, experiments carried out by um, Rolf Warming, who uh, leads the Society of Combat Archaeology and others have suggested that a covering is essential for a fully functional shield. Although there are, there are no remains of um, any covering on either shield from Szczecin, it's prob probable that it originally had one. Now this might be surprising because in the case of the painted shield, the paint was applied directly to the boards. So you may think, well, if it was covered, you wouldn't see the decoration. But actually we know that um, very thin rawhide soaked in linseed oil actually creates a very effective weather resistant transparent uh, layer. And you can see uh, on the right of the screen that that uh, book cover has actually been uh, covered with linseed soaked rawhide and yet you can still see the design clearly. Um, if anyone's interested in finding out more about uh, shield coverings and what they were made of then I would recommend uh, Ralph Shields of the Viking of the Iron and Viking Age which was published in 2020. So when first discovered, the painted design on the shield was clearly visible. Unfortunately, subsequent to that, uh, some of the detail lost. The design is hard red with yellow highlighted edges, and the border is delineated by a black line, decorated with alternating red surfs and black holes with yellow rosettes painted a black uh, background. Special analysis identified the pigment as vermilion to produce the bright red, iron oxide, which creates a deep red, arsenic trisulfide, otherwise known as orpiment, which gives yellow, calcium carbonate white, and also an identified, unidentified black compound. So far from being an attractive design, the various painted elements have, a much, more, have much more complex symbolism. For example, it's known that many decorative um, mounts evolved out of practical fittings designed to keep shield boards together and secure straps in place. In the case of the alternating circles and ovals around the edge of the painted shield, they may have been inspired by such fittings or more likely precious or semi-precious stones, many of which would have had a talent. The color red dominates the painted shield and had long been a popular color due to its association with combat and warfare, 
as well as the sacred. And in one Norse poem, for example, it relates how the displaying of a red shield on a vessel was taken as a declaration of war. In fact, red is one of the predominant colors found on surviving Iron and Viking Age shields. So turning our attention to the straps, the arm strap is positioned 50 centimeters below the upper edge of the shield. Now the rather low position of the arm strap has led some individuals to suggest that it wouldn't have been very well balanced. However, this really depends on the shield's function, what it was designed to do. For example, it might have been specifically designed for siege warfare, enabling an individual to crouch beneath the shield more effectively. Uh, and we can see in the image on the, on the left that such shields existed. And they were of a variety of shapes and are known from both pictorial and written sources of the period. Nonetheless, the arrangement of shield straps used in the 11th and 12th centuries but was by no means standardized. The Bayer Tapestry, for example, shows a wide variety of styles of which the most common are shown here. The unpainted shield features holes for the arm straps and probably a guige or supplementary strap. However, intriguingly, there are further holes located at the very base of the longest plank and their function has not yet been identified. Uh, we've theorized though that it's possible that they were used to enable the shield to be tied vertically to a post as part of a defensive feature. However, this suggestion is um, very much hypothetical. So what can we say in conclusion? Well, as early as the mid 12th century, kite shields were being made with straight upper edges rather than round ones, presumably to improve the vision, which led to the development of heater type shields. These developments were gradual though, and during the final decades of the 12th century, a number of different types of kite shields were at use side by side. Dating to the very end of the 12th century, the Szczecin shields with their angled upper edges represent a lesser known style during this period. By the beginning of the 13th century though, the popularity of the kite shield rapidly declined. Fabricated from a series of older planks joined together by an organic glue, the type of shield construction used on those from Szczecin can be traced back to the Roman Iron Age and continue to be employed throughout the medieval period. Based on the data gathered and comparisons made with other examples, there can be little doubt that both shields were functional objects designed to be used on the battlefield. This is confirmed by the presence of arm straps, which would otherwise be unnecessary. The two shields from Szczecin represent the only known surviving kite shields and are thus of immense importance to our understanding of medieval technology and warfare. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you, Keith. The uh, practical home improvement advice as well as shield information. Absolutely. If, if, can I just say, if anyone does decide to make their own glue, please get an adult to supervise them uh, if appropriate. So uh, just kind of sticking on, the, not, not intending to make a pun, but sticking on the topic of glue. Uh, we had a, a question, couple of questions from Mike Hansen about some practical aspects of the, the shield sort of aspect. Uh, so one was... Were rawhide shield coverings glued onto the face and back of the shield or held in place with the rim? And the second, which kind of follows on from that, is if they are glued in place, are there adhesion issues between the coating and the, the casing glue, which is frequently used? Um, as I understand it, uh, shield coverings could be both glued in place and held in place uh, by the fittings. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that Rolf is doing quite a lot of research into this. So he's probably, if you contact him through the Society of Combat Archaeology, he's probably the best person to advise on uh, how it actually functions on the battlefield. We think that in the case of the Szczecin examples, um, the covering was actually glued to the surface, but there, there are no traces of this. Mm -hmm. um, the covering was essential though. Um, a shield, these kind of shields can take quite a lot of punishment with a covering and with a rim. Uh, without them, they can quite easily be broken. But uh, I would recommend reading Rolf's article uh, published last year on uh, coverings to find out a bit more. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that answers a bit of uh, Chris's question as well as if glue is strong enough, no need for cross patterns. But if the coating is shrinking the shield together, it's giving it that extra strength. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, other, other question on, uh, I guess, construction from uh, Peter, which is, are there any traces of how the rim would have been attached? Um, not really. Um, you do find shields with a series of small holes around the outer edge, which um, indicates a, a leather rim that's been sewn on. Um, in the case of a, or in the case of um, other examples, then the rim is sort of just held on by the natural springiness of the, the metal itself, a sort of clamps around it. Um, we don't really know what the rims would have been like on the Szczecin shields, given that it's a 12th century shield, a kite shield, um, it's likely that it was leather. Uh, certainly there were no, there was no evidence of any, of any metal fitting. Mm -hmm. Going back to, to origins as well, a uh, question from Laura, is the term kite shield itself old or modern? Uh, the, it's pretty modern actually, and uh, it's, it's interesting if you look into the literature, uh, the variety of terms used to describe this. So you sometimes find people describing kite shields as almond shaped shields or teardrop shields. Um, certainly in the Middle Ages, no one was going around saying, oh, this is a kite shield and this is a teardrop shield. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a shield. Now, some, some shields did have quite, uh, did have specific names. So there are large, um, Shields used in siege warfare that in southern France were known as variously as Talvacchia, for example. Um, but I'm not aware that a specific term generally applied to kite shields. Um, in the Islamic world, um, yes, there are specific names given to different types of shields. And it was an analysis of those names that led this one researcher about 10 years ago to conclude that the kite shield, the kite shaped shield, uh, was actually uh, an emblem of the Fatimid dynasty. Yeah, and on that topic, in fact, we've got a question. What's your opinion on placing the origin of the kite shield in the Byzantine Empire? Well, one of the earliest depictions of a kite shaped shield comes from an ivory casket, a Byzantine ivory casket, which I think is 10th century might be 9th century, 9th or 10th century. Um, now, some people have postulated that one of the wooden, I think, wicker shields from Dura Europos uh, may not have been oblong, as some people have suggested, but may in fact have been kite-shaped. So there is one school of thought that thinks that uh, kite-shaped shields um, were a product of Persia um, from the early centuries um, AD. Whether the Byzantines then adopted uh, that shaped shield from their Islamic foes, or whether um, the shield from Dura Europos was oblong and was instead the kite shaped shield was instead developed by the Byzantines, we really don't know. Um, there are so many questions about this. And if you type in kite shaped shields onto the internet, you'll find numerous discussions on Google with various people arguing it was the Byzantines and then other people arguing it uh, came from the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. Personally, um, I, I really don't have an opinion. I don't know. It's something that I would like to look into further because it's certainly a very interesting subject. I mean, one of the, the, the common tropes about kite shields is that they're, they're a mounted, you know, they're for a mounted warrior. But we had a question specifically from Chris, would the size or pattern of shield differ for foot combat and mounted? Based on the iconography, mm -hmm. not really. Um, when you get, when you look at manuscripts or indeed um, carvings from uh, capitals found in churches or monasteries in southern France and, and Spain, and you get mounted and foot soldiers carrying mm -hmm. kite shields, then the iconography suggests they were of similar size. Um, again, there's a lot of debate about whether the kite shield was developed originally for mounted warriors or for soldiers on foot. Generally, the consensus is it was designed for mounted warriors because, you know, it gives you good 
uh, protection on one side of your body down from, from your neck down to your feet. Certainly if you had a very long kite shield, it would be somewhat unwieldy on foot. Um, but the iconography suggests from, an, from a very early date, right from the beginning actually, that kite shields were widely used on foot. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, that, you know, we, we talk about, you know, sometimes the shape might be a disadvantage, but not having a shield at all is probably a bigger disadvantage Absolutely. than a slightly yes. inconvenient shield. Uh, so we had a couple of questions on the Trondheim shield. So one, one for Mr. Gustafsson, I think he might have handled it, but if, if he needs any more information, let us know in the chat. The other one was, uh, have you examined it yourself? Or is there some literature on it that you might recommend someone who's perhaps interested? On the Trondheim shield? Yeah. Um, there is literature on it. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I have my copy of my article here. So I can quickly look up a reference for you. I think Ralph might mention it in his study. Um, rather than waste time now, it might be best if the person inquiring gets in contact with me via my work email and I can provide them with the reference. I was going to say, I was going to say for, for detailed stuff, if we've not got it instantly, if anyone has any questions that we don't cover, it's inquiries at armories.org.uk and that will get you through to one of our curators who can ask, you know, can answer these, uh, these sort of the, these weighty ones or ones that might need a reference that they don't want to hastily jot down. So going back to something that maybe a little bit simpler, but uh, I had a couple of questions about how much do these shields tend to weigh? Oh, <laughs> we didn't, as far as I remember, we didn't weigh the, the shields mm -hmm. from Shechen. Um That's a good Please. question. I'm afraid I can't answer it. I'm sorry. Presumably it's tricky because you don't actually know how much more of the shield there was beyond what you've... Uh, yeah, you've exactly. Done. I mean, I'm always referring back to Rolf, but Rolf has done so much work on the, on the practical aspects of these shields um, that he would be the best person to answer. Again, he can be contacted through uh, the Society of Combat Archaeology. Mm -hmm. Uh, one very quick one on the uh, unpainted shield. You mentioned how you'd managed to date the uh, the previous one, but did you do? Was there dendrochronology done on the unpainted one, or was it just pottery kind of context stuff? I believe it was um, ceramics that mm -hmm. established the uh, dating of that one. I don't think um, any chronology was done. However, if he's listening, then my colleague Dr. Lech Marek might. Uh, might say otherwise, but I, I don't believe there was dendrochronology. And a, a, a one from uh, Rolf that sort of leads off that actually, were there any other artifacts found in the two archeological contexts? Um, with regards to arms and armor, no, not as far as I know. In fact, uh, Rolf has put a uh, reference to his paper on Hyde, so I'll just type a quick answer. Thanks. And that should appear in the Q&A if anyone's interested in, in finding out more about that. Uh, okay, and on, on this topic of ageing, actually, this was, this was one that interested me. What was the evidence for the Pitt Rivers Shield and the Swiss example being so recent? Uh, let's see if I can... Am I still... Is my screen still visible? Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah, if I go back to it... So it's, it's not a particularly large shield. I mean, that doesn't disqualify it from not being an original one. Um, it's really looking at the quite crude way in which the leather has been attached to it. Um, you can see particularly in the bottom right that you just have numerous pieces which are, are nailed in all over the place. Now, there is absolutely no evidence on surviving shields for such a scattergun approach to applying the nails. Um, also, when I was shown more detailed mm -hmm. images of the leather straps and the attachments of the leather straps, again, they had more of a, a 19th century feel to it. Um, the shield is also, I can't remember the exact thickness off the top of my head, but it is a pretty thick, sturdy shield, um, which again, wouldn't really fit in with um, surviving examples. I mean, on the surviving shields, 
the, the wood tends to be thicker towards the center anyway and tapers out. But as I said in my lecture, um, they are fairly thin objects. And then that was, that was what I replied to the inquiry. And then when they went away and actually looked a little bit more on the papers that have been deposited in the museum along with the shield, it seems quite likely that this shield was actually designed to be used either in theatre or, or in a pageant. So the two strands of evidence really led both of us, the curator there and myself, to conclude that um, it's, not a, it's not a medieval shield. Uh, so a, could, a couple of questions, one from Douglas, one from Marco. Uh, essentially, what's the reason for the change from round shields to kite shields and what are the factors that lead to the adoption of the kite shield? Is it fashion or for military purposes? Uh, well, don't forget that kite shields didn't suddenly overtake round shields. Round mm -hmm. shields and kite shields existed side by side for a couple of hundred years. Um, really, and in fact, on the Bay of Tapestry, for example, uh, you can see uh, a mixture of kite shields and round shields still being uh, carried by the Anglo-Saxon house cards. And we know from mm. other iconography that round shields continue to be used for a long time after that. Um, it's really with the... The kite shield comes into its own with the knightly classes in, in Europe, so they're mm -hmm. fighting on horseback. A round shield, although you can use it from horseback, Romans, for example, Roman cavalry used round and oval shields. If you're going to effectively protect um, more of your body while you're on horseback, you need something that's going to protect you from your neck down to, down to your foot, and a round shield really isn't going to do that. And also on foot, it provides um, extra protection as well from crossbow bolts, um, arrows. So it's really a, a gradual change in the way that warfare is fought. The predominance in the early medieval period, particularly in, in France of um, the mounted knight, mm -hmm. that um, it's found that the kite shield just offers, uh, offers greater protection. We had a question from Neil about whether they were the kite shields were originally long enough to be planted on the ground as part of a defensive shield wall. Now, I presume not, but again, to how, how long do they tend to be? Well, uh, considering that uh, the shields from Szczecin, both of, both of which are incomplete, um, we can't really say for certain how long what the standard length of a kite shield was because there are no other surviving examples. I mean, based on the iconography, then it's certainly possible. I mean, on the, the unpainted shield from Szczecin, we have the uh, second pair of holes right at the bottom of the shield. And there's actually a further pair of holes right at the top, which were presumably for transverse straps. Now, other people might have different ideas, but um, when I saw that, my first idea, my first thought was that these straps were used to hold the shield against a, a post which had been pushed into the ground. So. I don't see why um, kite shields couldn't have been used as a, a temporary field fortification. Yeah. Pre presumably though, uh, thinking about a shield wall, all your important stuff is your head and your chest and you don't want to be moving your shield down to uncover those to, to give you. So field fortification, possibly possibly not shield wall, but, but up in well, the air. Again, there's a lot of debate on uh, what the shield wall actually was, and uh, <laughs> there's so much debate about everything, but, um, you know, were these shields, round shields and kite shields, were they to be designed to be used quite um, defensively, where you didn't really move them very much, or did you fight much more dynamically with them? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, this debate applies to uh, Greek shields of the classical era as well. You know, what is a phalanx? Was it this very tight formation where all the shields are overlapping? You didn't really move it very much. They were big shields to cover as much of your body as possible. Um, my personal feeling, having you know listened to mm -hmm. Rolf and also read um, around the subject, is that uh, kite inclu shields, including kite shields, were designed to be used much more dynamically. And certainly, if you look at the Bayeux tapestry and the system of arm and hand straps depicted, 
um, you can see that they're designed to be gripped in different ways, depending on what you wanted to use the shield for. Sorry, I'm just not, I'm busy in the chat. Uh, Lech has very kindly both confirmed that the unpainted example is well dated according to the ceramic context and given a reference to the Trondheim shield, which I have just rebroadcast in chat. So hopefully. Right, I'm, right. Thank you, Lech. Get that. I was interested. Uh, just get back to the QA because there was one I was going to bring up. Yeah, that, that actually brings up another point from, uh, from Chris, which is. How does the has any sort of practical work been done into how easy the kite shield is to use as a weapon compared to a round shield? I presume shield bashing and that sort of stuff. Uh, yes, yeah, some work has been carried out. Um, actually, uh, using the Szczecin shields as a model, um, various uh, individuals in Poland, for example, have attempted a number of reconstructions um, to see how how well it functions. Um, to my knowledge, though, no completely accurate reconstruction of the painted shields has ever been made. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the future, that's one project I would like to do is recreate a few examples of the Szczecin shields, some completely flat, some maybe with a slight curve. Although, again, as I said, I don't think they had, well, I'm pretty sure there was no acute curve. And actually test these out and see how effective they were. I mean, my, our theory that uh, they could have been used in shield warfare because of the position of the straps, mm -hmm. which would have covered more of the face, is just, um, is just a theory. So practical experimentation, I'm sure, would actually help us understand the Shechen shields and kite shields in general uh, much more. A lot of, recon a lot of um, tests have been done with round shields, though. Again, Rolf is a leading figure in that. But uh, kite shields, no, not really. Mm -hmm. uh, a request to see the slide showing the reconstruction of the painting again. Mm. I had a question about that actually. What's the association between red and the sacred? Is that a pagan thing, early Christian? Um, well, Alec has done a lot of work on, on this and he actually contributed, well, he contributed a lot to the article, but he actually uh, concentrated a lot on the significance of the colours on the shield. Um, and he, he might be able to type an answer, but red is certainly associated with the god Mars, for example. If you look in um, medieval manuscripts, Mars sometimes has red skin. Um, the use of red banners in warfare is um, in, Med in the Middle, e Middle Ages is well known, the Oriflamme, for example, uh, the French uh, battle standard. Um, a lot of people have associated the use of red crosses on shields as uh, having a crusader connection. Uh, yes, that's true, but in this, in this situation, I don't think that um, we can associate the cross on this shield with uh, any crusaders. Mm -hmm. More likely had a, a general um, Christian association providing defense um, for the individual wielding it. We had a couple of questions on uh, damage and resistance, effectively. One on whether the being planked vertically means they would split more easily, although I presume the rim would do a certain amount for that. And the other being just generally how much damage is a shield meant to sustain? So are we talking sword, axe, arrows, that sort of stuff? Without a shield covering without a rim, um, shields are going to split and shatter quite easily. With a shield covering and with a shield rim, um, they are surprisingly, well, they shouldn't, I suppose it's not really surprising because you want a shield to, to be able to do its job, but they are very effective. And actually uh, there have been some tests carried out which show axes and swords almost bouncing off the rim of the shield and the shield is, is still nonetheless um, fairly thin. Um, as to how long they were supposed to last for, um, I think in certainly trials by combat, I might be mistaken, but I think you could have the choice of having a number of shields which you could reuse if your shield was broken. But certainly on the battlefield, you would want it to withstand damage for as long as possible. Uh, you don't want your shield shattering uh, five minutes after you enter the fray. 
Um, now, there has been some discussion about whether, and in fact, it might be visible on the slide now, whether some of those scores in the surface of the shield and the cut on the right upper part of the shield actually reflects weapon damage. Um, I think it's unlikely. We know that uh, when this shield was uh, recovered, that it was accidentally damaged by some of the, um, some of the spades. So it's very difficult to know whether any of those score marks come from damage. But, you know, it's, um, it goes back to this story about, um, you know, armour generally being very heavy that you can't move around in it. Well, what's the point in having it? It's the same with shield. You know, it's there to do a job. And if it breaks after five minutes, there was really no point in you having it um, at all. And again, yes, it is going to defend you against um, arrows. And it's one reason that you might want to use shield a bit more dy dynamically is to be able to move it around and protect you from missiles. I mean, the thing is that there's no there's no sand, standard sword stroke or axe cut or anything like that. So it's very hard to tell exactly how much force you can you can put into something mm. like this. Uh, Alexander has, has pointed out the, the shield reach construction from Patrick Lesota. Are you familiar with that at all? I don't think so. No. He's dropped a link in the chat. Just uh, it, Effectively, someone has reconstructed, I believe, these particular shields. So, uh, yeah, something to have a look at. I was curious if you'd come across it before. but uh, if I know of one Polish guy who's attempted numerous reconstructions of the shield. I'm not sure that might be the same person. I honestly can't remember. Um, and he certainly favours the interpretation that uh, the Szczecin shield was quite acutely curved mm -hmm. based on um, iconography of the period, which does show a lot of very curved shields. However, this is a point that he and I fundamentally disagree on. I don't think there's anything on the shield which suggests that. Um, certainly, when Lech and I examined the shield, we um, examined the edges of the planks quite carefully, and they all seem to be cut at right angles. Uh, so no suggestion that it was um, the boards were angled in any way. And also my, the point I made earlier that I would expect if an acutely curved shield was covered by a lot of soil, it would be broken and deformed like the ones found uh, from the Roman site at Dura Europos. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, his work is still valuable in trying to understand uh, how kite shields work, if I've got the, the same person that uh, you're thinking of. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've probably got time for just one quick question. So one, one was from uh, Petra on a point that you brought up earlier, which is, uh, what's the evidence for specialised she siege shields that you mentioned earlier? Um, there are literary references to it. Um, the I mentioned... Talvaki or Talevas uh, being used in, in southern France to um, form these very large uh, shields which were designed to be used in siege warfare. There are other literary references as well, which obviously I can't give you now, but if you, if you write in, I can possibly mm -hmm. find that. And then um, images. I showed you one image of quite large curved shields being used to defend, defend soldiers, undermining a fortification. That's not the only one. There are other um, <clears throat> depictions from earlier and later than that, which show um, shields being used, specialist shields being used in siege warfare. Again, it's, that's very much a theory and hopefully with regard to these shields, and hopefully if we do get to reconstruct them, we can really test out different arm strap positions and find out whether this was a shield that could be easily moved around, dynamically moved in close course of fighting, or whether mm -hmm. its overall size and the position of the straps means that it was used much more defensively. And again, if we connect these to the attacks on the town of Szczecin in the late 12th century, then it makes sense that the attackers <clears throat> would need um, quite large shields to defend themselves as they were approaching the ramparts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one, one last question just to end us on a, a little bit of a lighter note. Someone from YouTube asked, do you have a favourite kite shield decoration? Oh. <laughs> Would you have gone with the, the classic pure red or something a little bit more elaborate? Personally, I really like the ones on uh, the Bayer Tapestry with the wavy crosses. 
mm -hmm. um, I suppose, because it's just so familiar to all of us that, yeah, um, I wouldn't, you see some very elaborate decoration in the, uh, in the Spanish manuscripts. Personally, I think I'd stick to uh, the Norman style. <laughs> The class. I'll, I'll always stick with the classics. There's a there's a reason Absolutely. they last. <laughs> That's great. So uh, yes. Yeah, so thank you very much, Keith, for, for today's lecture. As we said, right. for any for any questions that we, you may have that we weren't able to get through, it's inquiries at armories.org.uk, and that will get you through to one of our curators, and they will be hopefully able to answer or to recommend literature or something along those lines. And thank you to everyone who's been contributing lengthy answers in the in the chat as well uh, unfortunately i haven't been able to to share all of them that have been incredibly useful so thank you to keith thank you to robbie for producing the event behind the scenes and thank you to you the audience for taking time out of your day to attend and for the questions you had for the speaker uh, and as mentioned if you would like to find out more about these specific kite shields there is an art article co-authored by keith in the museum's journal arms and armor so our next event will take place on the 18th of February when Dr. Lauren Piper, one of the museum's specialist conservation team, will take us behind the scenes to explore the work that goes into preparing a gold lacquered Japanese armour for loan. For details of these and for all our future events, keep an eye on our website, which is royalarmies.org. Follow us on the social media network of your choice and consider following us on Eventbrite. In the meantime, thank you again for spending time with us and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. I will leave you with the closing slides.